So Richard Dawkins has got this catchphrase, science is the poetry of reality. And it's usually taken, I think, as a kind of romantic flourish. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, that's probably the best way of putting it, a romantic flourish. But I think there's something very literal about it, actually. And I suspect that Dawkins knows that, and I think that's why he, was, why he used that expression. Science is the poetry of reality. So let me just think about that for a second, because when he talks about reality, he's not talking about this. He's not talking about what impacts the senses. He's a scientist. He knows that our senses fool us. He knows that as I look around in the world, even though I, my perception seems to be telling me that I'm seeing a continuous world, he knows, as I know, that that's not what's happening at all. My eyes are, are moving around, catching tiny little snapshots of the things that my uh, eyeballs are, are fixating on for a second and then moving on. And I'm building this image from tiny little fragments. Most of it's, it's complete confabulation. He knows that, so clearly he's not talking about this. He's not talking about the solidity of an object when I hold onto something. Because he knows, as I do, that solidity is an effect of the forces that's at work within matter. Uh, forces which you know, hold together uh, essentially point phenomena, subatomic particles. And, the, the, and separated largely by space. So he knows that. So he knows it's not about the senses. He's not talking about that kind of reality. He's, talking, he's not talking about naive realism, in other words. What he's talking about is the series of, of, of constants that exist within nature. The stuff that we can find out about through experimentation. The stuff which Phil, uh, Philip K. Dick, the science fiction writer, described so well. He said, reality is the stuff that doesn't go away when you stop looking at it. The stuff that stays around, even when you're dead. The stuff that seems to have some kind of eternity in it. I don't want that's a highly coloured word, I know, but let's, uh, let's hang on to that. You know, the, the, the laws of nature, we might call them. The fundamental properties. The fundamental relationships. That's what science is about. That's what the reality of science is trying to make poetry out of. The fundamental properties the unchanging relationships, the constants that are at work in the universe. It's that reality which science tries to access. So why isn't, when Dawkins says this, why isn't he just saying science is the study of reality? Because he doesn't say that. He says it's the poetry of reality. And that's a really particular thing to say. And I think it's a really interesting thing to say. And I think, it, I think it's literally correct in many ways. I think what he means by that, or at least the interpretation that I'm taking away from that, is that when science does its work on the world to try to uncover those constants and those laws of nature and those fundamental properties, when science does that work, it works in the same way that poetry works and produces the same kind of properties in its artefacts that poetry produces. It's not, it doesn't, yeah, I'll go on to the differences at the end perhaps. So for, so, so, for example, one of the things that science does is it works on samples. You know, if you wanted to identify the toxin that's in these plants here, which are nettles, if you wanted to identify the toxins, the chemical structure of the, con of the toxin, the unchanging chemical structure of that toxin, identify it really clearly, you wouldn't sample every single nettle on the planet. You would take a sample, you would take this nettle here, and you would take it to the lab and you would do various extraction processes on it and you identify it. The part would stand in for the whole. That sample would tell you everything you need to know in that particular case about the whole. In other words, it's a metonymic relationship. Just like in poetry. When in, in, um, in poetry you would not... When a, when a poet writes about love, they don't write about every single lover that, they've, that every person has ever known. They don't write about every single relationship that's ever existed. They don't need to do that. When John Donne writes about his, his lover, he writes about his lover and is very specific about the sample he's taken because he knows that we can metonymically project, we can unpack that metonymy and apply it to all the samples of all the love affairs and we can recognise the, the universal nature of that claim from the very specific sample he's taken through that, that use of metonymy. And so science is doing that. It's using metonymic when it uses samples. 
And the reverse is true, you know, it's a kind of synecdoche relationship. Some science takes thousands and thousands and thousands of different readings some kinds of scientific procedures. You need to take lots of readings, you need to constantly keep recalibrating the instruments, constantly processing acres and acres of data. In order to be able to get a statistical viable result, you need to find that, that uh, spread of those data points. You need to cut out errant examples of that. You need to set the error bars in place. You need to do the statistical uh, mean. You need to do the standard deviation calculations in order to be able to get the single result that comes out of that vast sea of data. So in other words, the, the whole, the entirety of all those examples, all those measurements, stands in for the part. So when we say that, in the statistical sciences, when we say that, you know, the, the average intelligence of a population of humans is exactly 100 on an IQ scale. Of course we don't mean that every single human has, a pop, has an IQ of 100. It means that we've applied statistical techniques and to come up with a single figure result of that. That's synecdoche. In poetry, that's synecdoche. You take the whole and reduce it to a part. And of course science is ripe with irony. Irony is all about distance. Irony in poetics. Poetic irony is all about distance. The fact that we are separate from the thing that's going on. If it's a, a poem or if it's a play, we, we, we see the action unrolling in front of us from a, a detached, uninvolved position. We can see what's happening to the protagonists in that drama or the, the lovers in this poem. The, the details of that relationship. We know more about it than the actors do. And that's what produces the effect. We have ironic separation. And isn't that pretty much exactly a defining feature of what constitutes an experiment? We stand on this side of the fume cupboard door. We stand on this side of the experimental technique. And by definition, we isolate ourselves from the operating conditions of the experiment. If we don't do that, then we say it's a failed experiment. We call it experimental error. We, talk, we, call, we call it confirmation bias. Scientific um, processes are completely saturated with necessary irony. And I could go on. There's all sorts of other poetic effects. So when Dawkins is talking about science being the poetry of reality, Oh, I should just say, yeah, about the effects, actually. The effects of this. What are the effects of this? What does science produce? It produces, re if it's done well, and if it's done by people who know what they're doing, and if it's read by people who understand what they're reading, it tends to produce things which are quite often genuinely moving, in the way that poetry is genuinely moving, and affecting in the way that other kinds of poetry is genuinely affecting. A, a good science has an elegance and a beauty to it. It doesn't need to have, it's not a necessary function, but it has that function because of the way that poetry works on it. You know, seeing a really great equation, like the classic E equals MC squared, it strikes you as, a, as something approaching beautiful because it's captured so much of this reality, so much of the stuff that doesn't go away when you stop looking at it. It's captured that so well in such a tiny set of symbols that you can write down the back of a napkin. Or when... Um, or Euler's equations, which puts together some of the great constants of nature, E and I and uh, pi, all in this fantastically balanced equation. You know, when you do that, it's, uh, it's hard not to look at something like that. Uh, it's hard not to look at something like that and think, and, and just kind of feel, yeah, this is, this is, you know, touched the skirt of the muse, this stuff. You know, this is the, this is the uh, you know, not only is this the stuff that doesn't go away when I stop looking at it, this is the stuff that I can't see, but it lies behind everything that I can see. You know, this guy, or this woman, who's created this equation, who's found this piece of scientific uh, truth, and expressed it in such a compressed poetic form, is, uh, you know, has really added something aesthetic to my life. But it's not fake, it's not wrong, it's not evanescent, it's not, 
it, it's not fiction. It's as fact as anything can possibly be fact. It's as expressive as reality as anything can be. But it's poetic. It's completely poetic. And I think that's what Dawkins means. That's what I want him to mean. When he says that science is the poetry of reality. I got tangled back. <laughs>